Hi, I'm Fernando Guerra, director and professor at Loyola Marymount University, where I direct the Center for the Study of Los Angeles. Uh, today we have two guests with us. One is Linda Waugh, who is a trustee of the Pasadena City Community College District. She represents, I believe, Area 5. And next to her is Mayor Pauli Lowe of the City of Rosemead. I want to welcome the two of them. We're going to talk a lot about local government, uh, women in local government, and Asians in local government, and the growth and incorporation of both of those groups into our civic life. Uh, well, welcome, Linda. You. And now, you got involved in politics, but actually you were appointed to the board originally. Is that correct? That's How did correct. that come about? Uh, the Area 5 uh, trustee, um, she left her, her post um, before her term was finished. So she was into her second term. Um, I also belong to the National Women's Political Caucus of Pasadena, which is a group that seeks and trains qualified women for uh, public office. And so when this position became vacant, uh, the board had decided that instead of having a special election, which would have cost them $150,000, that they would do an appointment for one year and then allow the position to run for a, a general election. And so um, the women asked me to run. They thought I was qualified. I lived in the area that was going to be represented. I'd been a long time uh, supporter of women in politics and um, and had also been peripherally involved in education although not as deeply as I am now so it just seemed like a good fit and uh, ran against nine appointees and it was um, our nine candidates for the appointment and the board deadlocked nine times before I finally got yeah. appointed so just to make clear when we talk about area it's another way of saying district and so right. the uh, Pasadena Community College District is um, divided up into uh, five or seven districts? We have seven sub-districts. Right. So and, then, and then one of those, you represent which communities? I represent the communities of South Pasadena, San Marino, and the west part of Temple City. Right. And so then it's not unusual. Most of us are, are used to the fact that if a state senator becomes a congressman or an assembly member leaves or whatever, there's always a special election. But there's a high cost to that and actually a low turnout. And especially with these budget constraints, a community college district said, hey, we don't want to spend the money on that. And we're not sure what the turnout's going to be. And so they took which the law allows them to do to actually appoint an individual. But the law doesn't really determine how that process is going to work out. Uh, so every city or community college district or school district has to decide on its own. So what do you think of the process that they, that they chose? Well, you know, at the time that this, um, this vacancy occurred, education was under some very, very tight um, economic constraints. We were uh, reducing the number of classes. Um, there were many schools that um, had to reduce their programs. And so I think from a, an economic point of view, I think it was a prudent fiscal decision. Um, and also from a community point of view, it, it made sense. Um, it was a chance to give someone a um, a chance from the community to um, to step up to the plate and to run. We had um, nine people who put in an application and wanted to run, um, all very well qualified people. And now, so anybody could put in an application? Anyone could, right. as long as you lived in that district. And um, everyone submitted their resumes and their application and the board got down to, uh, they reviewed it, they scaled down to five of the finalists. Um, and I have to say, I, I am the first Asian American to be on that board in an area of which three of our seven districts are primarily Asian American. So I think it gave um, the community a chance to have someone from, um, from within our ranks mm -hmm. kind of weigh in, someone who had not been in politics. And, you know, it's, it's so common that when you're an incumbent, it's much easier to then get elected over and over again. So it gives um, everyone a chance to kind of get in and weigh in and there were uh, two there was one other Asian who ran besides myself so um, I think it was a good opportunity yeah. but uh, part of the I think the rationale from what I remember hearing and reading is that there wasn't much time left in the term anyway and you would be up for election pretty soon after that so after you got appointed how much longer before there was the election an actual election of the, of the uh, where the voters got to decide the prior trustee had only completed the first year of her second term. Mm -hmm. So there were actually three additional years left. Um, and so what happened was um, the board decided to appoint for one year 
and um, to allow business to occur um, without holding up anything because they didn't have that seat filled. And then that whoever got appointed, if they wanted to, then they would run or anyone, it would be an open election for the remainder of the two years. And so I did run for um, the remainder of the two years and then I just ran again this last, um, this year. For, for a full for, for my year. full term, my right. first full term. Right. Okay. Uh, Polly Lowe, mayor of Rosemead, um, you know, uh, explain to I think the students and the audience that um, many cities, there are 88 cities in the county of Los Angeles that actually most of them don't directly elect their mayor. It's not like Long Beach or Los Angeles or Inglewood, but Rosemead actually follows the more common pattern where people like yourself are elected to the city council and then amongst yourselves you select who's mayor. Talk a little bit about that. That, that is correct. That is the, uh, the model that we have in the city of Rosemead. Is first you have to get elected on the city council and you basically need to uh, have the, um, the buy-in of the, the rest of the, the council, um, the support of the rest of the council and uh, in order to be elected as or appointed to be the mayor. Yeah, so what prompted you to run for city council? What, what, one day you just woke up and you said, ah, I think I want to run for city council. Well, uh, not, not quite because, um, uh, because I'm, I'm not really typical involved in politics in the past, really. I, I think I really categorize myself as I'm one of the very typical you know, Asian, Chinese that you know, don't pay much attention to politics. So I can so relate to that, right? Um, and the reason I got involved but that, was... that's not true in China. Everybody in China <laughs> pays attention to politics. Yeah. So why would someone who's Chinese now in America not pay attention well, to politics? That is actually a very interesting point. And actually, throughout the last few years I've been in politics, I learned a lot. And actually now, getting Asian in politics, getting them you know, as part of the election process is kind of like my biggest, my pet peeve. Like wherever I go, whatever opportunity I have, is, is my mission to, um, to educate a lot of the Asians to cast their vote. Mm -hmm. You know, I realized that it is just so important, which many don't realize that. Right. Um, but to, to get involved was really to kind of help out the community. I, I just happens to have the chance that um, my, uh, in my area, my community, there's a group that wanted me to come out and run. And I, uh, I was a little shocked when I was asked because I'm going, you know, what do I know about politics, right? Um, but I think what I end up doing was really run um, the election and run the campaign with my heart, meaning just to let people know what I want to do for the community. And it just happens to, I think, that also I think it was timing. It was at the right time where the city was um, not in such great shape that people was really looking for change. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when me as a challenger has the chance, because it is true usually the incumbent really have a uh, much bigger advantage than, than the challenger. Well, I mean, everybody knows you're qualified. You're a graduate of Loyola Marymount University. So that, <laughs> that, that, right. by, that by itself puts you in a special tier. Thank so you, yes. I know you also went to some other university somewhere around here, but <laughs> I forget the name. I can't remember. Uh, but I got uh, my master here. So yeah, it is but it but important. it was in in the in, in uh, computer science. So it was not in the social science. It wasn't in politics. It wasn't in in the area that typically you would think that you know you would then go go into uh, 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 politics. So back to that original question, you know, was there something that you thought I could do this? It's not you know uh, there are issues that I have to I'm concerned about. So what were the issues that really prompted you to get involved in politics? I think it, at that time, uh, my city was very run down. Um, we were so stagnant. We, I remember my campaign was, I have a picture, someone actually took a picture of this really broken, ugly couch sitting on the sidewalk, and then in the back of it is graffiti. That is how my city was, and mm -hmm. I'm going, this is ridiculous, right? And what I wanted to do was, I wanted to use my, my engineering skills, I want to use my management skills to bring that to the city and move the city forward and to make it more uh, progressive. And that, that is what I believe in at that time and that's what I believe in now. And I believe that I have achieved that. And again, I think it's timing. I think at that time, the residents wants that. They want that change. They want to be progressive. They were tired of being stagnant. Yeah. I mean, when I think about Rosemead, I don't think of it as really that poor of a city compared to others in Los Angeles County. I mean, certainly I don't think of it as San Marino either. But I think of Rosemead, I think of uh, Southern California Edison headquarters. I think of uh, Panda headquarters. 
uh, you know, I, I think of uh, a lot of potential assets that, that exist in, in Rosemead. And really, there shouldn't be a reason like a city like Rosemead should be run down. So there, you know there's a problem when those type of things start, start to, to happen. Exactly. Um, also, what's incredible is the population shift that has occurred in Ro Rosemead. You know, when I was growing up, and it shows you how old I am, uh, it was mostly a white community. Now I think it's over 95% Latino and Asian, mostly Asian. It's it's true. Very, very uh, a major shift that has that has greatly occurred. Yes, it has. So, um, when when you talk about two things, it is women in politics. There's been a lot of discussion about that because in the Los Angeles City Council, made up of 15 individuals, there's now only one woman. When at one point five of the 15 or 20, you know, or 33 percent were women, and now we only have one, and and that's not unique. Um, one of the studies that we did here at Loyola Marymount University is we talk about the top 100 elected offices in LA County. And by 2006, as many of the students will tell you who are studying that for their midterm next week, in 2006, 41% of the top 100 positions were held by women. And today it's declined to 22%. So while we symbolically have the LA City Council only having one woman, it's not unique to the LA City Council. You also see it occurring in a variety of different areas where you have um, uh, these other positions, state legislative positions, et cetera. You uh, obviously are, are both female, both elected officials, but have always been very active in terms of women causes, not just Asian causes. What explains you know, this great growth of women, 41% by 2006, but now down to 24, 25%? Uh, and I don't think there's a right answer because I've been trying to study this and not figure, you know, haven't figured, figured this out. But so, um, Linda, what do you think? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, you know, it's, as I mentioned, I belong to the National Women's Political Caucus, and it's one of the, the stats that we are watching very closely. And, um, and yes, we do know that the numbers are dropping. Our motto is... Um, 50-50 by 2020, so we're really pushing to get more women. I don't think women. you're going to make it. <laughs> you I don't know you the to, power I of want, women. <laughs> I, 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 I want it to be that. We women can be very powerful, so have a few years to go. But um, So that was a challenge that it, I just get, yeah. It certainly is. And, and, you know, there's a number of reasons. I don't know if you can pinpoint any one thing, but certainly I think politics has gotten much more aggressive than it used to be. Um, I know just watching local politics in my area, my communities, which are pretty small bedroom communities and we're all very close knit. Um, I'm working with two women who are running and, um, and the politics are pretty, they get, they get pretty nasty, they get pretty ugly and you have to have a little bit of stamina to be able to withstand that. And if you're not used to running in politics, it can kind of knock you off your feet a little bit. Um, and I, I worried a lot about my friends who are the women who are running in those areas and worried that they might just back down and just say, you know, this is too much, I'm going to throw in the towel. You know, and I don't know how many of you have read that, that book, uh, Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg, but one of the points that she makes is oftentimes we women just assume that things are going to be so hard and we don't, um, we don't ask for that extra help or that uh, support that we need to kind of move forward. So I, I think it's been a change in the aggressiveness of the politics. It maybe knocks people out of the, the ring a little bit. And then, um, and then maybe women have more choices. And because they have more choices, um, that they don't feel that they need to push so hard for, for certain so things. So when, when you say they have more choices, many you know, more opportunities, more economic opportunities, more opportunities to run nonprofits and other ways to be civically involved other than just um, you know, being elected to office. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they right now women are doing very well um, in many of their careers. I come from a technology background, and so women do pretty well in technology. It's probably one of those industries that uh, where we don't hit the glass ceiling as quickly as you do in other areas, but you still hit a glass ceiling. It just takes a little bit longer. So women can progress and feel pretty secure for uh, quite a long time. There's much more flexibility in the workplace. So if women want to um, take the, the ramp to um, start their family, uh, they're more comfortable to, to do that. 
you know, and then take a job and, and have flex hours. In politics, you know, you're pretty much dedicated if that's what you're going to commit to. You're, you're a politician for almost full time. So, Even um, though these are part-time jobs that you both hold, they, I mean, how much do you get paid being a, uh, on the Pasadena Community College Board? Well, you know, it's, 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 it's called a stipend, and it's not a lot. <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's not bad. Okay, so... Um, it's like work-study money. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. And, but I have to tell you that I do think that, um, you know, when you look at your pyramid of the 100 mm -hmm. positions, the community college trustees, I guess, were the lowest rung, so we're the starting position to get into politics. Um, and I don't know, maybe in, in the days past, people only went to their two or three board meetings a month. But I... When I was asked to run, I made a commitment that I was going to do something that would make a difference for my community in education. And I was not going to be a 50-year um, trustee. I was going to go for a few terms, enough to make a difference, and I was going to work with my community to set goals. So when you ask how much time am I spending, I probably spend more than I have to, and I spend more than most trustees. But I feel it's a commitment I made. I, I retired before I was asked to go into politics, so I didn't have to go to a full-time job. Polly works full-time. So I had the luxury of being able to say, you know, I'm going to give this much time. And I probably spend about 30 hours a week at least so working in my community. So you spend about 30 hours a week. What do they pay you, like 600 bucks a month or something like yeah. that? That's less, <laughs> the, that? that's less than minimum wage. You know, Governor Brown signed a law about minimum wage. You're not even getting paid minimum wage as being a trustee. But, you know, if we make a difference in some student's life and they get through their college career, that makes a difference to me. It make, and it's a, it's a stat that um, a former assembly member, uh, Mike Eng, makes. He's now on the LACCD. He says That's for the every Los Angeles Community City right, College. Right, the Los Angeles Community College. And, and Mike gave this, threw this stat out at... Um, at one of my dinners and he said for every one dollar that we invest in the education of our kids we get four dollars back in economic development it, it contributes four dollars more I mean for every one dollar that we invest I mean that's a huge return on investment yeah. so uh, Mayor Lowe um, trustee here was talking about the amount of time and commitment you have a full-time job you work you, you work at Raytheon I do and I what, what do you what do you do there I'm a software project manager. Mm -hmm. And over here in El Segundo? Yes. Yeah, so that's quite a commute. Yes, uh, it is. And so, uh, and you work uh, as a project manager, you're probably supposed to only work 40 hours, but it's probably more than that. Uh, time and, to time. Yeah, and how many hours do you put in being mayor of Rosemead? I never really calculated, but I basically, my time is um, on the weekend, is pretty much all. Um, basically involved in, you know, meeting with people, talking to people, right? And then the meeting, the city council meeting, it is only twice a month. But there are times even during weekdays that I have meetings to meet with people, you know, um, basically to discuss just different things that, that, that's needed for the community. Yeah. So on the average, I don't know, probably 10 to 20 hours a week, I guess. Hmm. And how much does a, a mayor of Rosemead get paid? I don't rem you know, it's honestly, so little I don't that she doesn't even know. I don't even <laughs> really look at it. Um, all, all I remember is I said, if I spend the same amount of time working at Raytheon, getting paid overtime, I know I make a lot more than that. That's right. <laughs> so, um, what different, and this is a very general question, but what difference do women leaders make? What difference does it make that women are on city councils and on school boards? I feel that women that are serving, that I've seen as, that serve on the uh, city council or school board, I have to say, women kind of have a motherly instinct mm -hmm. that we really tend to really look at what is really good for, like we, we take the, the for school board, they take you know, all the teachers, all the students, like their own kids. You know, as on the city council, they will take all the residents as their own kids. They are very, really look out for them. Not that I'm not saying the men don't. I'm just saying, you know, I, I do feel that the women that are serving those positions are, are more of that because they, they really care. Um, to kind of answer your question of why do we think that less women participate, one is actually asked the question, do we have a good number of women um, 
participate in the election, just that they didn't win the election mm. and not able to win the So seat. in other words, I do we have as many women as candidates? As in candidates. Right? Okay. I think that is actually will be a kind of yeah, interesting yeah, number, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we can research and quantify. So it's a, mm -hmm. that's a quantifiable qu point, yeah. Yeah, and then, um, and also as, as a woman, I, for me, I understand, me as, as a mom, right, it was really hard for me to leave my kids home and say, Mommy have to take care of city business. Mm -hmm. I won't be home tonight, right? And, and they're probably saying, yeah, we can watch TV. We can do what it is. Like, <laughs> right. He can eat Pop-Tarts. <laughs> and at the same time, I have to have a very supportive husband, right? I literally just kind of text him, I won't be home tonight. You know, I have to go to LMU, you know, for this. And he was like, okay, right? So you, you really need a very strong family support. Um, and I, I remember when I ran for re-election in 2011, I asked my daughter. Now I have three kids. I have two boys and a girl. Now the boys don't really care what mom does, right? Mom, go do your thing. But my daughter, I'm very close with my daughter, right? And, and I have to ask her, I said, well, how do you feel if mom run for re-election? And I say, if you don't want mommy to run, I won't do it, right? Mm -hmm. Because it is a big impact on her because mom just disappear all the time, right? So I think the family factor is, is a, a big thing. Um, so if you look at for a woman to kind of step, step up and say, you know, I'm going to run for a, um, a elected office, one is, like Linda said, it is tough out there. Mm -hmm. right? You have the thick skin. You know, frankly, there are people who will say stuff that is not true about you. You have to. No, to in politics, that happens? No, yeah. <laughs> right? So you have to be able to kind of handle that. Right? Mm -hmm. And two is the family factor. Yeah. Am I willing to really give up so much, you know, give up my family thing in order to, to help the community, right? Yeah. I think that is a big decision, yeah. just those two. So a couple of points. Uh, one of our uh, colleagues here in, at Loyola Marymount is probably one of the best uh, known individuals who studies women in politics. And uh, the data that he's published in his books about women in politics, with a female co-author, by the way, is that, um, you, you, to your point, that less women run in terms of being candidates. And, and so the question is, we can't, even, we can't get women to run, so if they don't run, they're not going to win. Mm -hmm. right? And then second is that he's found that um, uh, women raise less money, and part of it is the, the ask. You know, that women are, are, are very good at getting the meetings and all that to a political contributor potentially, but then don't do the hard ass to the same degree. Now, there are variations. There are some women who are very good at that, you know, and, and then some men who are not very good at that. But he found that two of the most important variables were women not being candidates and then uh, um, women not raising as, as much money. And I think that's an interesting part. I was also thinking about that raising money. I, but I also look at the other side. Is it possible that the donors also question when you have a female candidate, they will question, well, the, does she really going to win this election? Mm -hmm. And then if they hesitate, that's when they won't give you the money. Yeah. Right? So I think there's also that question out there that do, do the, the general public, do they truly believe that we women can win? Mm -hmm. right? And I think that is, that is something we need to work on to show that, yes, we can do it. And, and it's not like I fully believe that we can do the job, right? That's no doubt. But the question is whether we can win that election. That's two separate things. Right. So mm -hmm. electoral politics versus governing, two very separate uh, skill sets, et cetera. But you have to have the first to get to the second. Exactly. So, you know, in terms of the question about do women make a difference when, when, you, when they are on, on the board, do you have, because um, we really don't have data about this. You know, now we have data, for instance, that um, female police officers make a difference, that they're much less likely to get into uh, um, uh, struggles. They're much less likely to be involved in uh, um, uh, shooting incidents, et cetera, and that women officers tend to create and calm situations to a greater degree. There we do have data. So you see in a public service arena that women do make a difference, but we don't really have data in terms of city councils or school boards that women make a difference. I think we all think they do, but we just don't ha ha have that data. What's your thought about that? Well, you know, there's a uh, saying that women get into, um, into these positions of power to make a difference. They have a goal. Men get in because, uh, because it's, um, 
it's a power, it's a position of power. It's a way for them to exert power. It's not so much that they have a goal or an objective. But yeah, women sometimes are they do very, to build a career. Or, well, yeah. right, but it's not so much of a community objective. Right. So this kind of goes back to what Polly was saying, that women are looking for ways to better their community. To um, And so that maybe is the nurturing part of it. You know, but I wanted to perhaps touch on one thing, too, that you, you spoke about, Dr. Vera. So, you know, I, I do know an example of a woman who ran very hard for a, a tough position, and she raised more than her opponents raised. So she quickly raised like a half a million dollars. But um, and, and what type of seat was this for a city council? Assembly. Or assembly. assembly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Anyway, that's a lot of money. Sure, so, it was. I mean, she did it in a very short period of time. Yeah. And, and so this also goes back to something that um, Mayor Lowe said is, um, can women win? So sometimes women can be aggressive enough to make the ask, but if they're seen as too aggressive, hmm. then they're not seen as viable candidates. And so this person I knew was very, she was very assertive. She um, very understood the, the machinations of politics, but seen as way too aggressive and um, I guess not likable enough. There wasn't enough of a likability factor for her to get that position. So on the one hand, we're saying women aren't aggressive enough to ask for money. And then when they are aggressive, they're like, oh, they're put off. Mm -hmm. Whereas a, a, a male can be aggressive and it's like, oh, that's what they should right. be in terms of politics. Right. And so it's like the damned if you do, damned if you don't type of uh, uh, situation. Right, and you see this in the examples of, um, I mean, even, um, Wendy Girl, when she ran for the mayor, you see this in examples of um, Hillary Clinton when she mm -hmm. ran for the presidential race. And uh, there was a really good book about the Clinton race called Dirty Words on Clean Skin, and I met um, the author. And, you know, it's very telling about how women ended up, I, and it wasn't, it was primarily focused on Hillary Clinton, but, you know, it, it talked about all women who, during that time who were running, Sarah Palin, and how they were portrayed. And so it, you know, even if they use the same tactics that their male counterparts use, they were not perceived as being likable enough. Yeah, even in this day and age, certainly not only Los Angeles, but New York has had a mayoral election in, in 2013. And the front runner, you know, in 2012, people perceived Wendy Gruel to be the front runner in L.A. And uh, in New York, they perceived uh, Christine Quinn to be the front runner. And of course, neither one of them ha has made it so that you, you, you just see this consistent. And right. interestingly enough, as I mentioned before, you see it uh, to a greater degree today than 10 years ago. And it's very difficult for me to try to understand why that's happening right now, that the, the decline of women elected officials is uh, um, not in every area, but uh, in, the, in the major positions. We're yes. just uh, seeing that happen. Um, so, uh, Mayor Lowe, when you got uh, into uh, city council in, at Rosemead, what were your, your goals, your vision for the city? Did you have specific um, policies that you wanted to pursue? Well, my, um, I have several goals. One is I want to change the city to be more progressive, you know, kind of more in, in general. Right. I'll give you one example. In um, in 2005, it was a shame to say that in 2005, the city of Rosemead didn't have a website, and I sort of got on the case of the city council. I said, "Are you kidding me?" I said, yeah. "We don't have a website," and they're like, "Well, we don't need one." I was like, "Yes, you do." So, uh, so after I I got in um, when I got elected in 2007. I was pushing a lot of technology. For example, one thing I pushed is I said, you know, I want residents to be more engaged. Right? I said, you know, honestly, me as a resident of, of Rosemary for a long time, I live in Rosemary since like 80, like 86. And I said, I really don't know what's happening in Rosemary because you guys never really let residents know what's happening. Right? You don't have a website. You, you claim that you have some sort of newspaper come out, which I never gotten. Um, so I pushed for uh, having the city council meeting stream online. And they kind of like, what an idea. Um, now, it's interesting enough, even though I have a couple council members that, um, that are not into technology, I would say, but I think that suggestion, they wouldn't dare to say no. Mm -hmm. Because I said, you need to be open. People need to right. be engaged. Now, you, you have this technology. You have this ability to let people know what's happening. If people choose not to watch it, that's their prerogative. 
but you need to be open about it. So that's something I push. I push for technology. I push for efficiency. Um, when, when I first started, I remember my city manager told me um, one day, he said, he was very excited, he said, Polly, we are printing our checks now. And I'm going like, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> And he go, uh, yeah, we, we used to, we have to sign checks, like, by, you know, they have to type up checks and, you know, use type. I go, you got to be kidding me. Like, <laughs> and it was just like, people say that when they work in behind, when they work in City Hall, it's like a, what do they call it? Like, like a time zone. Like, it, it went back to, you know, the 60s or the 50s. So there's a lot of things that actually happen um, in City Hall that people don't know, mm -hmm. right? And when I walk in, I'm going, look, guys, you guys need to be efficient. So I'm constantly like on the city manager and on staff, like, think of ways to make this more efficient. Don't just don't tell me that this is how it works. This is the famous line. Oh, this is how it works before, so we don't want to change it. No, 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 no. I said, that line needs to be out the door. You come up with what's efficient. Hmm. So I'm constantly, even now, I'm constantly working with staff, working with a city manager that you guys need to work that. I think those are things that I kind of brought in, in in an engineering world, like mm -hmm. you know, working for a company. That's what we constantly look at: is how do you do things to make it better, and how do you save time? How do you save money? Yeah. And I think the last few years I've been doing that, and I'm con still continue to have to do that. Yeah. Well, you work for Raytheon, and here at Loyola Marymount University, we love Raytheon because Raytheon used to own this building, you know, and you were uh, able to. Uh, sell it to us for a, a, a good price. And so yeah, we, we, yeah, we very, <laughs> we very much uh, appreciate that. Let me s uh, switch gears a little bit and, and talk about Asian American politics in Los Angeles County. Um, there has been a tremendous growth in the number of local elected Asian uh, officials like yourselves. Uh, we see now about uh, five or six, maybe even more cities that have a majority of Asian Americans on their city council, including San Marino where you are uh, a resident. Um, but wh while we see a lot of growth in that area, it's also interesting that we see a lot of growth in some major uh, uh, statewide boards. But like in between, there's not much um, in terms of Asian representation. Increasingly some, but nowhere near what the population is. So the success stories. Uh, number one, the California Supreme Court. Four of the seven are Asian Americans. It's the, the, only, the, the only other Supreme Court in, in, in the US, uh, the Hawaiian Supreme Court. So those are the only two that have an Asian majority. And you, it's, it's a big accomplishment for a, a, a state that is not anywhere near being Asian majority. Um, the Board of Equalization, which is a very significant political board that really equalizes and deals with tax policy, at one point, four of the five uh, were uh, Asian American, and I think now three of the five. Again, a very uh, a significant uh, position. And then you have certain individuals, whether it's um, uh, 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 Congressman Honda in San Jose or Judy Chu in, in, in L.A. County. But, you know, here, there, a couple of assembly members never really been able to, to sustain it, uh, with the exception of, you know, Judy Chu, uh, Aang, and now Chow, I believe. That's the only area where we've had consistent uh, um, Asian American representation. But in some of the cities, we're get, getting to see a lot more. Um, what explains the, and, and you know, you could have uh, other examples of John Chung, state controller, uh, in the past, um, uh, uh, Senator Hayakawa, uh, Matt Fong, who was treasurer, these are all Asian Americans who held statewide elected office. That, that's about four or five times more than Latinos have, have won. And people think of Latinos as the political power in, in California, but Asian Americans have done much better than Latinos in terms of winning statewide office. Okay winning local office, not so good winning those middle offices. There's not an Asian on the Los Angeles City Council. And, and only one in the, in the history, Mike Wu. There's not an Asian on the LA County Board of Supervisors. There's not an Asian right now on the LA Unified School District. And so you can go on and on, and, and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of pockets of non-representation. Um, what explains some real great successes? Pretty okay at the very local level, but in between, Asian's not doing very well. Any sense of that? Because I've been studying this, and I don't have a sense. 
You know, I, I also have been looking at that because it, it was really disturbing to me that in LA City Council we have not had an Asian since Mike Wu and um, as you know, former assembly member Warren Furtani uh, right. made a run for it and right. did not get it. And so, um, and so the API caucuses have been looking at all of this and data. And API stands for American Pacific Islanders. Right, Asian Pacific Islanders. And, um, you know, in the, in the old APALC, which was the Asian Pacific American Legal Center, now called the Advancing Justice uh, Center, has got a grant and they do uh, studies every year on the API statistics and, and what's happening in the county. Um, that might be interesting for, for your group. But, um, you know, like, for example, in LA City, although Asians are the, the most rapidly increasing minority uh, in terms of growing population, we're spread out, so we don't have concentrated pockets of people to vote. So um, there's really only a small percentage of APIs in LA City that could really vote to make a difference. But you look at, um, as you said, Professor Vera, the, the successes like Congresswoman Chu. Congresswoman Chu has had success not necessarily from the API community. She got her, her support actually came from the Latino communities. So she was able to cross the bridge and to appeal to a broad population. And this also happened with controller uh, John Chung. Um, and I also think that when you see, you look at the positions that you uh, noted in high power, many of those positions like the um, equalization, the controller, the treasurer, those are all kind of financial positions. So we as an API group are considered to be good with numbers, whether or not we are, but it's, it's not. So are you good with numbers? Oh, I'm terrible, Let's oh my see. God. <laughs> if I don't have a calculator, <laughs> I can barely. <laughs> But um, yeah, so it, it's really a myth. Um, a stereotype. <laughs> it is, it is. And um, you know, and, and so, but it's, it's in a way, it's, it's not so hard then to get into those positions because we don't have to overcome and, and, and tell people that we are good with numbers and we can balance the budget. So they, they see you as being qualified for that. When you look at the lower level positions in terms of the local um, elections, you see the pockets like Rosemead, like San Marino, where there is a, a much higher concentration of the API populations. Mm -hmm. And so you see that our population now is um, getting more interested in being of positions of power to make a difference in our community, to make decisions about the community. So they're running at that level. But Assembly, Congress, where you have to go across broad areas, that's a little harder. The justices are appointed, so I think a lot of that depends on mm -hmm. who is doing the appointing. Um, you see, in the state of Washington, when Gary Locke was the governor, their community college he was, trustees, uh, even though it's Locke, he was Asian American. Right, well, he still is Asian American. Right, he, he still is. He, yeah. <laughs> and, and now he's the, our ambassador to yeah. China. But um, you see, their community college trustees are all appointed. That state has the highest number of community college API trustees of any state. We actually have a very low number. Um, I think we only have like 12 or no, tw 20, I think, out of uh, 73 or, or no, tw 12 out of like, I don't know, tw 20 out of 400 trustees, mm -hmm. I think, are APIs, which is a very low number here in the state of California, considering California has a pretty high API population. But it just depends on where you, you are and where the pockets of the population are located. So what you're basically saying, as I hear you, is that in the larger jurisdictions, the um, Asian population is too dispersed. Yes, for instance, in the case of the city of Los Angeles, yes, we have Koreatown and Chinatown, Little Tokyo, Filipino Town, but they're not uh, next to each other, so it's difficult to create a, 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 um, a district. And even having said that, the ma vast majority of Asians don't live in those neighborhoods, right. even though the Koreatown is obviously majority Korean, et cetera. The majority of Asians do not live in Asian dominated neighborhoods, so they're very much dispersed. Right. And so to create districts that are African American or Latino, those communities have the advantage of being, in a sense, segregated and therefore being able to create these districts. But when you have smaller jurisdictions like Rosemead or, or San Marino or Monterey Park or Carson or places like that, you, you, you do then have the, the, the concentration. A mayor? 
Yeah, I think I, I agree with what Linda said. It is harder when um, when the area is much bigger because, um, like in Rosemead, like in San Gabriel Valley, it's easy for um, resident community to know us, right? So it, it's a little easier for Asian to get elected on the city council or the mm -hmm. school board. But once you go statewide, is is hard to get our name out there. Mm -hmm. I think that's something. If you look at Judy Chu or Mike King, I think they have worked um, sort of in that field for many, many, many years. So they have built up a relationship with not just the Asian, but also so. in, a, in the Hispanic community. So they, they know them. Mm -hmm. So that's why they are able to get elected at a statewide or federal level office. But it's, it's hard from um, at the local standpoint. If, if you ask me, yeah, you know, I'm in Rosemead. I would say I'm pretty well known in the San Gabriel Valley. Mm -hmm. right? If you ask me, well, Polly, do you think that you can win a statewide election? I would say no. You know, I, I don't think my name is out there. Yeah, but if she were a man, she would say yes. <laughs> so, that, so we start getting to that That's situation. True. <laughs> right, so it is uh, it's a little of a, you know, bigger challenge, I think, mm -hmm. yeah, for the Asian. So um, when, you, when, when you think about, um, well, I asked you this question earlier in terms of women. And the question was, do women elected officials make a difference? Now asking you the question in terms of Asians, do Asian elected officials make a difference? Does it matter that we have Asians in the elected positions? And the more difficult question, because I think symbolically all three of us would say yes, is how do we show that? How do we prove that? Well, what's, the, what, what's the data that t uh, says that, yes, Asians do make a difference in politics? Well, I would say, for me, it does make a difference because of my, uh, my Chinese background. So I understand some of the tradition. I understand some of the, the heritage. I'll give you a perfect example. We recently have... Uh, have and, and you're saying that because Rosemead is a very high Chinese Asian population. Mm -hmm. Right. right. And <clears throat> we have um, um, someone that wants to have a business in city of Rosemead, and the business is a type of, um, in China it's called tie da, is a, uh, is, is a, you can say, is, I call it a, a, a um, circulation therapy. And that is, uh, and it actually is very, very related to, in the ancient time, a lot of Kung Fu, um, people that practice um, Chinese Kung Fu, they get hurt and they go through this therapy, right? Now, it was so difficult for the city to, accept that business and all they keep saying, well, it's a massage business. Well, it's not a massage business. It's a, it's a circulation, you know, yes, they massage you to help you circulate, you know, mm -hmm. your, um, your, your blood flow, but they go, no, because they're touching you, therefore it's a massage business. So the whole business is under the regulation of a massage business. And I'm going, really, right? But even now, we, didn't, we were not able to change it, but I have to step in kind of to help explain you know, to, to the city manager, to staff, that there is this type of business out there. Right? Because I understand, I have seen it when I was little. Mm -hmm. So it's something that I can relate to. And I right. think that's when it helps. I understand the difference. And for someone that I've never seen it, you know, they just don't understand. Right, right. So I think it, it helps. Yeah, absolutely. Back. Especially when you're talking about a community that is over 60% Asian, which is mm -hmm. Rosemead. And so, so that's a substantive example but there's also symbolically that the, the citizens of Rosemead want to feel that the city council reflects who they are. And oftentimes it's whether they're homeowners, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, or whether they're Asian or Latino. You want to see people who are up there, somewhat, someone like you. So how do Asians make a difference in elected office? Yeah, I, 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 can, I do think that they make a difference. And I can tell you that um, just being the first API um, on this college board in a district where three out of our seven districts are heavily API, and I'm only representing the third largest of those districts, so the first two aren't represented by APIs. Um, it, it made a difference because I think I was able to point out issues that were occurring in the API community among the students. Um, I don't know if you know that in education, in higher education, um, if you're a primarily uh, Hispanic serving institution, and so PCC is an HSI um, institution, which means our largest um, 
uh, minority population is Hispanic, but our second largest is um, API, you can only qualify for grants for the Hispanic. You can't do both. So that means the Asian, the API population was not, they're not getting any extra help. So, um, and that, that may seem like it's okay because I know that there is this model minority myth but when you look at the Advancing Justice um, API data that cam comes out, um, they show that when you disaggregate the data about the APIs, um, we have a very, among our fastest growing populations, our factions in the API are the Pacific Islanders and Filipino Americans. And they actually rank even below uh, Latinos and oftentimes even below African Americans in terms of economic status and educational retention. So we're missing a whole group in there that we're not helping because there is, because they're lumped in under this model minority. Um, and so I was able to point those things out and, um, you know, and, and I think that, uh, you know, part of my job as a trustee is to ensure that we develop policies for education to serve, better serve our communities. And so I was able to point out which of our communities was not being served. And we have to certainly address everyone and kids who are really um, at the, you know, who are not college prepared or come from districts where we're having a harder time getting them in as college prepared and so we need to give them basic skills. Yes, we need to address them, but we also need to address this group that comes under this model minority that isn't being addressed and maybe they're just language uh, English uh, learners, but they're doing well in other areas, but they still need that additional help. So, um, I do think I've, ha I've helped make the, uh, the board more aware, the college has been more aware, we've been addressing it. We've talked about uh, forming coalitions um, with um, the Latino educators so that we can, we can help make everyone successful because you're only as strong as your weakest link and if any kid is not doing well, you know, then no one's, our college is not doing well and I think we all understand that. So I think it does help to bring uh, a perspective about your um, your community to your wherever so you're serving. You, as a representative on the board of Asian descent, give voice to that group and, and and are willing to be there and ask certain questions that probably would be asked if you're not there and lead the discussion in certain ways. Not that the others are against that per se, but they mean just not bring it they're up. Not aware. They're not right. aware of it. Right. And so symbolically, that's significant to have someone like you uh, be there. Um, is, are there, I, I know there are groups that, that uh, try to bring uh, Asian Americans uh, together, elect, uh, elected Asian Americans, you, you know. Yeah, well, that's why I'm, I'm asking. <laughs> so you are the president? Yes, I am the president um, for the Chinese American elected officials. And um, I... So where do you guys meet? Where do we meet? Mm -hmm. We actually, our meeting in various places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't have a, uh, a set, we don't have an office or anything like that. So we just, um, we will hook up with, you know, different community leaders and sometimes companies that they, they want to invite us and use the facility. And we get a tour and kind of get to know them as okay. well. So and how many members do you currently have? We have, um, well, there, there's two fold on in terms of membership. One is um, if you are a uh, Chinese American elected, official, whether former or current, mm -hmm. um, we would send you a letter and ask you, would you like to be part of this organization? And you don't have to pay. You know, basically, we just want you to acknowledge you and recognize right. you. And then, uh, and, and then the second point is if there are members that would like to be a uh, pay member, if they pay the membership, then they are voting members. Okay. So I think in terms of voting members, I think we have about 30. Um, and that's just LA County or all of Southern California? It's pretty much Southern California. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, and, and one of our goals uh, is to, to help uh, other uh, Chinese American elected or, one, or candidates, I would say. Right. So, like recent, what we have done is um, um, we have um, election coming up, and what we did was we invite um, those candidates to come to our, our functions. Mm -hmm. Now, the, uh, we call it CEO, Chinese American elected officials, and so in short, we call it CEO. CEO will not endorse any candidates, but I see that as our 
kind of our job to give them opportunities. Mm -hmm. So we invite them to come to our functions. Um, like in September, we have installation dinner, and we just invite them to come. And I, and I, tell, I tell those folks, I say, look, this is your chance to go work the room. Mm -hmm. This is the opportunity that we're giving you. Right? And, and uh, we constantly encourage people to participate, to run as candidates, and, and also um, ask for uh, uh, you know, people that could donate to donate money to, to these candidates. So I actually personally have been walking to, uh, for a couple of candidates that mm -hmm. I want to show them that, look, you know, this is what we commit to. Right? Other than we help you in terms of introducing you, I'm there to kind of help you walk. So I think it is important for the CEO to, to push that, you know, to, to take a, a, a strong stand that we are there to kind of help others and grow uh, candidates to be elected officials. Mm -hmm. So CEO, Chinese elected officials, but is it only Chinese or other Asians as well? Right now it's, it's only Chinese. I didn't start the organization, but okay. that's how it started. <laughs> so. So, but I know that you recently endorsed uh, Paul Tanaka, who's... Asian of Japanese yes. uh, descent who's running for sheriff. Yes. Uh, now, why did you do that? Well, it, it, I know. I actually, you know, before that, I get before that, I got calls and I, I talked to people, and people go, "Paulie, you shouldn't touch this race." And I go, "You know what? I have to do." Now, what why, when they say don't, why wouldn't, why would they say that? Well, the, first is they, everybody knows incumbent usually have a better chance. Right. Right. And but the incumbent, of course, is uh, Sheriff Lee Baca. Right. Mm -hmm. And and I think Sheriff Lee Baca have done a good job. Right. Um, but to me, is I, I sat down with, with Paul Tanaka, and I, I really grilled him. I mean, I asked him what he had done, um, what does he plan to do mm -hmm. if he is in office, and uh, how is he doing his campaign? Because, again, you know, those are the things that I look for. Well, um, exactly what you have done, it showed that what is your history, right? Uh, how, how do you think that you can make this better? Um, so I asked him some really, really tough questions. And then at the end, I said, you know what, I have to support someone that I, I believe that can make a difference, can do an even better job mm -hmm. right, than what we have uh, happening now. So I, I, I know that I might be getting calls and going, you know, Polly, what did you do that for? But I have to go with my gut feeling. And, uh, and I think he has to track records that show that he can do the job. And another thing that really touches me that I actually took in a big consideration. Before I met with Paul Tanaka, I have people going, you know, Paulie, you know, will you meet with him? I said, I'm not going to meet with him yet. I want to talk to some of the people that are supporting him. I want to talk to some of the deputies, commanders, that are willing to stick their neck out to support Paul Tanaka. And they know that once their name is out there, they can be transferred, which I said that even before actually is in the news, right. that they really could be transferred to someplace else, you know, very far from their home, or transferred to some other, other assignment. These people are willing to stick their neck out. And so I talk to some of them, and then I understand why they are. So to me, I feel like I want to stand with these folks because they are the ones that are hitting the street every day. They are the ones that's really out there. And I feel like if they are willing to stick their neck out, I'm there with them. Now, now some people may think that you're sticking your neck out because Rosemead um, contracts with the sheriff's department. Too. You don't have a police department. It's Correct. the sheriff's department, right? Yes. And so if the mayor of Rosemead is uh, not endorsing the current sheriff, you know, so he could just say, well... I'm not, I'm not particularly happy with uh, Mayor Lowe and, and Rosemead. I might send one less uh, a patrol car out there. I'm not saying he would do that. I don't even know if he's got the power to do that, but there's a risk. Well, certainly. I mean, he certainly has the power to do that. Um, but I, I also look at, I have other council members that are supporting Sheriff Lee Baca. So I'm going, I think each person has their own, um, you know, opinion on who they want to support. So I... I don't think Sheriff Lee Baca will do something like that, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I, I trust his, his integrity, um, but I know it is, you know, it is, it is what, what it is. You know, I have to kind of go with my guts and what I hope that what will be better for my community. So um, who was your political hero growing up? <laughs> well, I really liked... Um, 
Alan Cranston. So I grew up during... I don't think the students <laughs> even remember I Alan know. Cranston. <laughs> He's long past. You know, I grew up during the Vietnam War. I mean, I got to tell you that a, a <laughs> freshman at Loyola Marymount University today was born in 1994. <laughs> <laughs> even after my kids were born. <laughs> Yeah, so he, he stood up for uh, and spoke out against the war, and it was really a, a time, yeah, I grew up during a time when there was a lot of activism in the colleges, and I married the guy who was a big activist in my college. So The you know, big I, man on campus. Huh? Yeah, yeah, he was out there burning down the buildings. And <laughs> that, <laughs> that really impressed your mom and dad? Right. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you know, you're you're young and impressionable then. But uh, yeah, the war really was a, a big issue for us as college students, and so many of our friends were uh, being inducted into the war. And so it was. Uh, and he spoke out, and he spoke his mind, and it wasn't always popular. But um, but, and that's when I I always envisioned I could stand for um, for things that I thought were right, even if they weren't popular. But it was people like Alan Cranston who stood up and... Uh, and so he was U.S. Senator for, Cal for California, obviously in the United States Senate. Right. And I think he had served as controller for a little while before he got elected. Right. But always had a very tough re-election. He never, he never had an easy re-election. He, yeah. he, he ended up winning. Any others? Uh, you know, I, I was also very impressed with um, Pat Schroeder. Uh, from Oregon, and she was one of the first um, women in high elected offices, and she was pretty moderate. Um, she, and, but I remember that when she ran, um, I used to read a lot of articles about when her. When she ran for president, because she, she, well, she, she, she did, she, but even when she just ran for Congress, <laughs> for Congress yeah, yeah. Congresswoman. I, I read a lot of articles about her, and, and I was always really amazed at how how mean people could be just because she was a woman. And I thought, well, gosh, you know, why, why wouldn't we have, um, why would gender make a difference in the leader? But, and that's when I became most aware of how women were treated in politics and how I didn't, I was, I was not going to do that. I was mm -hmm. not, I was going to stand for something different. Polly, political heroes growing up? Um, not growing up, I would say recently, because mm -hmm. I really, I would, you know, didn't really pay much attention to politics. When Don't I tell the students up. that. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys should. Yeah, they, that is yeah. Today, <laughs> that's right. Because that is something I learned that, and, and actually I am telling my kids that they need to, they need to know what is happening. Um, I think for me is Congresswoman Judy Chu. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that she was able to, you know, in such tough business, she was able to, you know, stand firm and be able to kind of move up to all different level, be able to kind of, other than work with the Asian community, you know, she is able to work across um, the Hispanic community or wherever that she can help. Um, so I feel that she has done um, a great job. And, and watching her out there, it is pretty amazing. I mean, she attend a lot of events to be constantly be in touch with the people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's what, what I learned is being, once you are elected in an office, that doesn't mean that you just kind of hide in your office and, and don't know what's out there. Yeah. You have to be out there to be constantly to be in touch with the people. Um, and, and I think she just have done a wonderful job in seeing her um, going from, actually I think when I first know her, she was maybe um, as a city council, city council in Monterey Park. Right. Then state assembly, then state senate, then board of equalization, then Congress. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I mean, she have gone through a lot of yeah. fights, I yeah. would say. Yeah. And but she's also one of my heroes because before all of that, she was a professor first. Yes. Oh, yeah. that's, that's right. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you guys forget that. She, <laughs> no. you know, that's, that's how she got. <laughs> she got her start. She was a a, a professor, right. and so then then got got into uh, uh, politics. Um, when you think about some young people, whether they're local elected officials, Latino, Asian, or what have you, right now in politics, can you think of three emerging uh, uh, people that you say, hey, watch that person, because I think they're going to be, you know, uh, someone who is a rising political star. Anybody come to mind? Young people, mm -hmm. it's just Asian or any? A any, in, in Los Angeles County or California that you say, hey, that's a... Uh, that, that's somebody to, to watch, mm. you know. 
I mean, obviously, a lot of people say that because they still consider him young. Uh, Eric Garcetti, who's who's mayor, yes. you know, mm -hmm. and you can't help but watch him because now mm -hmm. he's mayor, mm -hmm. you know. So he he he's out there. But you know, it's always when when you find somebody like who uh, um, Antonio Viragoso or Eric Garcetti or uh, you know Alex Padilla, it, it's easy to now say, yeah, you should have watched them when they were younger, you know, because they were rising stars. But it, it's it's tougher when there's a hundred of them. Which one do you think is going to really r rise to? To the, to the top, you know. Actually, that's a little, that's a tough question. Mm -hmm. Because by the time we go out there, people will be going, how come you didn't say that I'm one of them? Oh, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's uh, correct. Well, any, anybody who, um, in your community, who's not in an elected position, that you would like to see get a, a little bit more involved and maybe even run for a, a public office? But, you know, I, I just recently attended the uh, Asian Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus, which is uh, formed by the, the legislators in Sacramento. And mm -hmm. so they fund training for up and coming um, APIs who are either in elected positions or positioned or they think will rise. And there were some quite a few really great people there. But I was really impressed with some of the young legislators who sponsored that event to, to help these young and upcoming people. So um, I've always been a great fan of John Chung. I think that he has yeah. just got great integrity and he is someone who represents the entire community and he doesn't just bank on his ethnicity as an API. So I, I just have great admiration yeah, for him. Yeah, but it's tough to define him as up and coming. He's like already <laughs> arrived. I mean, he's a statewide elected official. Well, well nothing to we, take away from him. We are, we are hoping that he will rise even higher. Yeah. Right? He, we think that he has uh, great potential. Yeah. Well, but there's I also ma many of us who think that he will be a, one of these days a, a candidate for governor. I, I hope possibly so. Possibly the first Asian American I, governor of California. I hope so. But one of the legislators that I shadowed under that training was um, Doss Williams who is uh, in the assembly. He represents the Central Valley District and he um, uh, worked under Jack Scott when Jack was a senator and then when he was a chancellor. And, um, and so Das has uh, been sponsoring education bills. Um, he, so he's in the assembly um, area now, but we're hoping one day he will be the senator. And right now, Senator Carol Liu um, is the chair of both higher education, well, education, uh, budgets um, at the Senate level, and so, yeah. her, so we hope to see. Um, so Das Williams, Williams, even though you don't think of Williams as an Asian name, Das is uh, Asian American. He, he is. He's uh, Indonesian descent, and he's also Latino. So, wow, well, he's mm -hmm. got it all. He's got it all. Uh, and, <laughs> and, 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 and Anglo and, last name. And Anglo. Latino, <laughs> Asian. So. Um, uh, well, and a farm boy. <laughs> and a farm boy uh, who likes to live in the city every once in a while. So. Um, uh, Mayor, uh, what do you think is the most important issue facing residents in your city today? What is the most important? I think we have resolved a lot of um, issues in the last few years. Um, I think for me is right now I see there's an increase in crime because of the recent realignment. They call it realignment, basically let people out of jail a little earlier. Because of the overcrowding and the state right. mandate, the court mandates, et cetera, yeah. Yeah, so to me, that's a big concern. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, we worked so hard the last few years to bring down um, crime, and now it's back up. So to me, that is a, a big thing that I want to kind of work on, um, which is kind of hard, right? We have to rely on you know, the sheriff department. We have some co-enforcement. We have mm -hmm. some you know, community policing that, that we can do. Um, but that, that is a challenge that, for me, that's, that's what I want to come yeah. with. And what can local elected officials do to improve a city's economy? Well, um, and that is something that I, I'm very big on, too, um, is to, to bring in development. Um, I actually spend a lot of time out there promoting, promoting the city, the city of Rosemead. Uh, you know, talk with developers, they'll, you know, encourage them to come and develop. Uh, it, is, it is not as easy as people think because you have developers that they don't just come in your city. You know, uh, we the city needs to provide a very good process to make it easy for them. Mm -hmm. And that is the other part of the development that I've been working on is to work with staff to say you guys need to define a, a much easier process. Because, look, developers don't have to come to the city of Rosemead. 
you know, I think in the past, the city of Rosemary, they, um, <coughs> I think, you know, in the council in, in the old days, you know, there's enough tax money for the city of Rosemary. We don't need these developers, you know. We are very big on protecting the residents, which is all good back then. Um, <coughs> but now, we don't have enough money. You need, you need the tax revenue, right? So, to me, it's, you need to kind of work with the developers to have good projects. And you have to, we have to change our, our attitude, our mentality. I think in the past was really like, we don't care about these developers. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I am able to change that. And I think, again, timing, I think people now understand that why I said we need to, to work with them. And, um, but it's still not as easy because, again, why would developer, why do they want to come to Rosemead? That's always the question. Yeah. So which sector of, um your city is most essential for economic growth in the next five years? Well, we have areas, you know, we have this one big piece of land that's called all the auction um, that we're trying to, to help develop that. Mm -hmm. um, so we have pockets of, um, of areas that can really bring in very good development. Uh, we have two major corridors, uh, the Valley Boulevard and Garvey, mm -hmm. uh, Garvey Boulevard. So those are the two main corridors that we are working on to how to improve it, to get rid of blights, and how do we bring developers in. We have one area uh, where the target is, is off the Rosemary Boulevard, is actually uh, we have improved that a lot. We have recently, we have brought in uh, TGI Friday. We have uh, Chipotle. We have uh, I like Chipotle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> so we have Wingstop. So those are new establishments. But you you got to mention Panda if you're the mayor of Rosemead. <laughs> right. So Panda is actually I mean, is Panda. That's the, the world headquarters. That's, that's our right. headquarters there, right? Right. Their headquarters is, is in City Rosemead. Um, well, so I, I I just gotta say it's pretty cool when you go into their building and they own a gigantic building and then they have like test kitchens there too and all kinds of stuff so you can walk around and eat and it's, <laughs> it's just uh, orange chicken. Um, oh, I love orange chicken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it is great to, to be able to see that uh, those establishments. And I want to add one thing is when I ran for office at the, the very first time, I remember I knocked on doors. And I have someone literally look at me and said to me, I'm not voting, I'm not voting for you. You're Asian. I don't need another Monterey Park here and, and close the door on me. And I'm going, you haven't even had a chance to talk to me. Hmm. Okay? And I guess I think what she's thinking is, you Chinese, I bet you you just want to bring in all these you know, Chinese restaurants, Chinese business. And what I, at that time, what I try to tell people is, look, I have three kids. They, are, they, they were born here. They're very much like American. They don't want Chinese food. I want to prepare the <laughs> city of Rosemary for the, next, for the, for the younger generation. Mm -hmm. And, and able to So that's bring why you brought in the TGI Friday. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and it's Chipotle. funny. And Chipotle, yeah. I, told, I told my son when I, when I first got elected in 2007, I said, son, watch, I'm going to bring you a Chipotle and roast me. Now, I was just really just saying that, you know, I have no power to bring it in. But it's great to see that actually happen now, that mm. what the city can do is to help with that process. So what makes a city business friendly? That is always that question, mm -hmm. right? And I always say, we need to, to make the city business friendly. And then our staff tell me, we are business friendly. Well, we are. We are, we are getting to the point where we're very nice to any uh, business owner, um, developers that come to the counter. We have definitely improved that, right? But I said to staff, what is important is how to make it save time. Time is money for developers, for business owners. How do you make all the processing, the licensing, the, um, the, the, the inspection, how do you shorten the time? You know, we have projects that takes like a year in order to get approved because of the EIR, because of, you know, all these processes that they have to go through. And I just continue to challenge staff, can you think of a way to shorten it so that mm -hmm. these business people don't have to wait a year and a half in order to finish the project? Yeah. Right. So you then have to talk about Walmart, <laughs> okay, because it, it was a big issue. It was a big Not issue. Not only in Rosemead, but throughout the county of LA and maybe even the country, people were looking at this. Explain to the students a little bit about the controversy regarding Walmart and the city of Rosemead. So uh, this happened around 2000, right before 2005, around 2004. 
Um, so Walmart wants to come and sit at Rosemead. It was a major controversy. And um, you have the, uh, the, the Rosemead Chamber of Commerce and the city council support the project. And you have residents that live right in that area that uh, oppose the project. This was one of the superstores, one of the very first superstores, right? Right. And, um, and both sides, and actually at that time, I was on the opposing side. And that's how my husband got involved, actually. Now, my Because why? Your husband was for it and you were against it? No, my husband was against it. Okay. And, um, and, and he really, he was the one that really helped, uh, went and got signatures to... Um, to, to so why was he against it? He was against it was a couple of things. One is he, he is in manufacturing. Actually, mm -hmm. he is a mechanical engineer. And he truly believed that um, by just purchasing, uh, well, he just didn't like the, the Walmart business model in general, that they buy cheap and the, he sees that the, um, the, the job is going to go, you know, go out of the United States. And so he didn't believe in that. He want a he want business that's in city of Rosemead that are that what he called responsible business mm -hmm. that is you know good for the, the people and good for the country, so so he at that time yeah he was you know part of this other uh, community group that was fighting it mm. and I, and actually that's how I got involved that you know that they asked me to run right so now kind of go, passing forward now now I'm on the city council seat and now I understand why the city supports it because I have to say Walmart has to has bring in a you know a big um, chunk of tax dollar for the city so that's because every time that there's a sale that happens in Walmart and you know they charge you the nine cent ta or nine percent tax yeah or is it eight or no it's what, is it nine now I think it's yeah, nine now nine. Yeah. yeah so so every dollar you spend at Walmart in Rosemead you pay nine cents tax what are those cents stays with the city of Rosemead, right. right? And so the greater the sales, the more money that Rosemead mm -hmm. gets. And so that's why cities compete to try to get Walmarts and uh, car dealerships, et cetera, wherever there's gonna be sales tax. That's one of the ways to raise, uh, to raise taxes. Right, and I, I have to say, you know, I'm trying to be very fair, right? And I come on and I said, yes, at that time, I was part of the, um, the, the group that opposed the project. Now, but, but throughout that, I think it actually made the project better. Um, I think also at that time, I think of Walmart as a very, um, I would say, a, a very low cost type of store and, and you just don't want to kind of bring in um, people you know, that affect the neighborhood. And in this case, because of the other objection, they actually made the store really, really nice. Right? Just the look of it, they really make it very nice. And, um, and I think it is also probably because there was a lot of pressure from the community. Um, actually, our Walmart works very well with, with our community right now. Like they would donate um, stuff to, to the schools, you know, they would donate water, they donate the school supplies. So they really want to be part of the community. Mm -hmm. And, and I, now I'm sitting on the city council seats and I see that and I, you know, I have to say they have done well. They have done well to be part of the community to help out. Now, some people might argue that they don't agree with the business model. And I say, okay, that's fine. Right? Including your husband, but. Yeah, so I just say, well, if you don't agree, you know, don't shop there, right? I mean, that's all there is. Yeah. So, right? so that means that he sends you to go to uh, Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kind of. So, so when, we're, when we're talking about the sales tax, it's kind of the, the fiscalization of land use, meaning that you want to have those type of businesses in your city to help your budget. And then what happens is cities begin to compete against one another. So what would you say are the top, you know, five cities in L.A. County that compete with Rosemead for that type? Um, well, for me, it's really just neighboring cities, yeah. right? I mean, I would say um, El Monte, mm -hmm. um, Monterey Park, Temple City, um, probably some Montebello because it's kind of adjacent yeah. to us. Yeah, but I, I, to me, I see El Monte and, and South El Monte. I think those two are... The big competitors. The big competitor, and sometimes I remind staff too. I say, look, I say, if we don't get our act together, the business will go that way. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you obviously represent a community college district, but the district that you represent includes uh, three cities: uh, um, San Marino, uh, South Pasadena, and is Temple, Temple City. And Temple mm -hmm. City. Um, when you take a look at those cities, 
uh, and you see what, what type of economic activity, uh, are, are, are they preparing for the type of jobs that your students at PCC would be able to take? or Because or, I think of San Marino really as a residential neighborhood. I can't, I can't mm -hmm. even think of, a, uh, of a, a single business. I mean, I'm not even sure that they have a McDonald's or, a, or even a payphone in uh, San Marino. Nope, don't have one. <laughs> Yeah, th those are really what we very call... Very different cities than Rosemead, right? Very. Temple City is probably the most industrial and, and the most commercial, um, but certainly not San Marino and not uh, South Pasadena, and they pride themselves as being these small little bedroom communities, although, um, you know, so part of the reason we are suffering economically is because we are these bedroom communities. We don't have commercial dollars coming in, and... Um, but and it's pretty hard to think of San Marino suffering. Well, you think that. I mean, you think like, that. But I'll, I will tell I, you, I San, Mar San Marino is San I, I don't feel that way. <laughs> let, let me tell you, because we don't have commercial uh, dollars coming in, it's all, uh, the economy is buoyed by the, by the residents. So we have four parcel taxes, two for public safety and two for education, mm -hmm. just to keep our schools afloat. Um, Luckily, education is the primary focus of those communities. So people want to live there because of education, because our schools are so good. But that then has to be funded by the residents mm -hmm. because we don't have commercial dollars. So when you say, you know, is the, is the community prepared for the kids who are getting out? I think the question really that I have been pushing our college to think about is, you know, are we preparing the kids to take the, the jobs of tomorrow. I mean, are they ready to go into the market? And, and I think this is one of the things that we in education have to do better, is we, we need to um, be better partners with um, the businesses, with the communities. Um, one of the things I think that, you know, I've, I've asked our communities to do is to think about providing internships for our kids so that not only do they get the academic learning, but they also get experiential learning that they can put on their resumes that help them not just have that competitive edge to get into their next educational goal, but also into the workforce. You know, and I, I, and I say this, and, and some people may kind of scoff at it, you know, even in San Marino and South Pasadena, you know, we're not just sending our kids for higher education just because we think it's really nice for them to be and have a higher education. We're sending them to these good colleges and these good schools because we want them to be successful in life. We want them to have great careers. We want them to be competitive. And it hurts all of us when we're graduating kids who go out into a workforce where there are no jobs and then we come back and we hear things like Silicon Valley has 3,000 jobs or 30,000 jobs and they don't have anyone who can come and take those because we're not prepared. Or we're graduating uh, kids from nursing but we don't have any jobs for them because we didn't give them any work experience but then we end up hiring nurses from other countries because they come to us with experience. So those are things I think we need to do a better job articulating what we're doing in education with the workforce development. Many people think, many people think that the pendulum with community colleges has swung. That uh, at the beginning, it was really a way to yeah go ahead and transfer to a four-year institution like Loyola Marymount, but also to trade to teach you certain trades and, and techniques that made you, you know, uh, employment ready. And that we that the community colleges have gone away from that and really try to focus on just transferring. And certainly at Loyola Marymount University, we're very happy to take uh, graduates from PCC, but do you think that we've gone too much away from just uh, trying to get the kids to transfer and not, not really train them in terms of technical skills and, and just do the two years and go out to the job force? Yes, I do. And, um, and I have to say that um, there's a lot of, there's a, a little bit of a stigma, and I, and I live in a in communities, I represent communities where that stigma exists, where if you don't have a college education, then somehow you're not going to be as competitive, you're not going to get a job, even if we're graduating kids out of college and they can't get a job. So, um, you know, I, I, and there's, so there's a little stigma then if you're leading them into vocational education, if you're leading them towards a certificate of study as opposed to a four-year college degree, are we doing less for them? You know, and I, I don't think that that is true. I mean, now that we're looking at the, um, the business and the industry stats, 
actually the employers are coming to us and saying, you know, we didn't require a college degree to do this, you know, and we're willing to pay, you know, a seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollar a year job for someone who can come to us with some skills, you know, and come to us at an apprentice level and then we'll, you know, we'll work with them. So, you know, I think that we have to give those choices to um, to you all, to our, our students, to this upcoming generation, and not place that stigma that you have, that a college education mm -hmm. is the end all to success. Well, I'm gonna ask you a couple more questions, but I know some of the students wanna ask questions. I know that uh, Audrey and Maria really wanna ask a question, and they're gonna come up here and, and ask a question. Uh, um, and I think Sean just uh, let me know that he wants to ask a question too. And so um, they, they'll be coming up here in a second and, and asking uh, uh, so, some questions. Um, Mayor, um, if there was one regulation that you think you could repeal by either the state or the federal government, what would that regulation be that you could just say, if you had a magic wand and you know, get, get rid of it, or one regulation or law that you would like to see put in the books that you could just, you know, get the legislature to sponsor and the governor to sign it. Well, which one would that be? I would repeal the realignment. And the realignment meaning that sending more of the sending state prisoners to the county? Yes. That, that is something I really hope that they can change that. Is I, I honestly feel like if criminals need to be locked up, now they have programs in there to help them, but they need to be locked up and not affect our community. Any law or regulation that you like to see either put in place or be repealed? Well, Giving you that magic wand, what, what would that be? You know, one of the things I'm focused on now is concurrent enrollment. And um, back in the old days when I was in high school, I was able to go to college while I was still in high school because I had already fulfilled most of my high school requirements. And then at some point, yeah, mm -hmm. I know. Nothing better to do with my time than go to school. But um, over time, um, there were some abuses that happened. And, and, um, and so the um, senator, um, I think Scott, and the governor at that time put some limits on how many uh, college courses any high school student could take that would count towards their college credit. So there were these ceilings. And I think that those are artificial ceilings. I mean, I, I certainly am representing communities where we have some really, really bright kids mm -hmm. who are really ready to go right away. And so why should there be this artificial ceiling? So I, and I think that rather than trying to fit kids into a box, we need to look at what their individual learning capacity is and try to accommodate them. So what about um, charging different types of students different tuition? That I would like to see that, you know, young kids who are starting that whatever it takes to get your AA, you pay a certain amount of tuition. And after you pass those units, your tuition is a little bit more. Or if you're an adult coming back, that you pay a little bit more than, than the um, uh, young student who's just starting out to get so many units. What do you think about that idea? Or do I not know what I'm talking about? No, you absolutely know what you're talking about. Yeah, that, that's very That's a great answer, by the way. <laughs> Did I get an A? Yes. <laughs> Uh, uh, great yeah. inflation. It's <laughs> yeah, it's quite a controversial subject right now. Um, you know, I, I, I talk a lot to our associated students about this. So I think that we realize that in California, education, higher education is basically free. And I know you're all coming to a private college, so that's probably not true. But in, in yeah, public colleges, it is, it is basically free. And um, and so at some point, you have to say, you know, you've got to put some goals and objectives. So what is happening now is um, the state is really subsidizing almost all of public education at higher education. So, for example, in community college, we charge $36 a credit, and it actually costs us $120 a credit. So that means that the state is subsidizing the remainder of that. So what's happened is, there, there have been, under the Student Success Task Force in the state, what they said is, you know, if you have taken over 90 credits, there should be enough credits for you to then transfer or get mm -hmm. your, meet some educational objective, but you cannot stay in college for 20 years at $36 a credit and take up room and right. not, 
you know, let someone else in, so you're, you're taking up space, you have to declare an objective, and so then we're going to charge you more. The, so I think that's right. What the students have come back and said is, you know, there, there needs to be some appeal process and maybe 90 units is not the right ceiling because you might have is, kids. Is 90 what gets you the AA? Actually, uh, you can get, yeah, 60 I think is like an AA. Oh, and so fine. 90 gives you like extra. But they, they made a good point. They said, you know, maybe you had someone who started in community college, dropped out, then got back on uh, to the freeway again and decided to start taking classes and has now changed their major and, and is very focused and you have to make exceptions to that. Another is maybe you have kids who are in, had financial aid and because we were so impacted in, um, in our resources in college that they couldn't get the classes they wanted so they had to take mm -hmm. extra classes just to maintain their, their financial aid. So they made a good case for saying maybe that 90 is not the correct ceiling. But I think the overall argument that at some point you're going to have to start paying for your education if you don't reach these objectives is, I think it's, um, it's a valid point. So one last question for each of you. Um, what's in the future for Linda Wah politically? Hmm. I think you should run for Congress someday. <laughs> You know, I because I got. You guys into have endorsed each other. I've, I've oh. seen the I've seen oh, the endorsements yes. list and all that. Polly so. and I are big fans of each other, but um, you know, I I I like Polly. Kind of fell into uh, politics. I didn't really have a plan that I wanted to be a congressman. Um, but I, I have to say, the reason that we invited you to is that because when we asked around and we asked that question, <laughs> who are some of the high flyers? Who's really emerging? Your names keep coming up. And so that's, you know, and also the fact that she's a LMU grad. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. <laughs> that had to be the big yeah. <laughs> Um, You know, I, I, I really, my whole objective is to really bring, whatever I do, I have to bring benefit to the community. And I have to know that I'm doing, whatever I'm doing is, um, uh, is really benefiting the community and it's really helping our kids in education. So, I don't know, maybe, I, you know, Judy Chu already has the con congressional seat. Ed Chow already has the assembly seat. So, not not much left. <laughs> What's in the future? That's kind of interesting. I I mean, for the longest time, I tell people I have no inspiration of going any higher. But it's funny. In, in recently, I actually have thought about it. And yeah, what caused you to think about it? Well, well, one is actually looking at your chart, also, uh -huh. yeah, <laughs> also going, oh my goodness, it's like, what, what happened to all the, especially Asian female, yeah. like, where are we, right? Yeah. And, and I, often I tell people when people ask me, well, Polly, you're going to run with something else. I said, oh, no, I have no plan. But I always end with, if there is a need for me to step up, I'll be willing to do that. That's right. With the right support, I'll be willing to do that. I'll vote um, for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, I think just looking at all of the different positions, see, I want to be in a position where I can truly make a difference, okay? Um, I believe in, in dealing with, with the, uh, the decision not because of the party, mm -hmm. right? I'm certain party, but I, I really feel that in order to make things happen, you have to put your party aside to do what's for common good, right? So being on a city council is great. It's nonpartisan, you know, we deal with what's best for the resident, we make decisions based on that. In our position now, I notice that it's kind of interesting to me, is the, the supervisor role, mm -hmm. the county supervisor. Yeah, that's nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. and yeah. right. right. But now, I fully support Hilda Solis, and mm -hmm. if she's running, I will never run against her, mm. right, because I think she would do a fantastic job, but if, in any case, if she happens to, and either she termed out or whatever, mm. if I have her support, I might think about it. All right, very good. I might think about it. Well, <laughs> Mayor Polly Lowe from Rosemead and Trustee Linda Wall from the Pasadena Community City College, thank you for coming to Loyola Marymount University. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much.